Wow, it's such a privilege and an honor to be here. I'd like to thank the leadership of this church for the opportunity. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Mom. Thank you, pastoral team, for the opportunity uh, to be here to share the word of God. My name is Shadrach Muindi Mbivi. I am born again. Christ is Lord and Savior in my life. I fellowship and serve at Deliverance Church Kaha Sukari, and I'm glad to be here. I am married uh, to one wife, uh, Dorcas Wanjiro Muindi, and uh, we are blessed with a son, Shani Muindi, and uh, soon and very soon we're expecting another one. And we bless the Lord for what he's doing to us. Um, our sermon today is titled, When a Nation Rejects God. When an, a Nation Rejects God. We read from the book of Jeremiah chapter 2 from verse 8 to 13. And this is what the word of God says. Jeremiah 2, 8 to 13. It says, The priest did not say, Where is the Lord? Those who handled the law did not know me. The shepherds transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after things that do not profit. Therefore, I still contend with you, declares the Lord, and with your children, children, I will contend. For, the, for cross to the coast of Cyprus and sea, or send to Cada and examine with care. See if there has been such a thing. Has a nation changed its God or Sorry, has a nation changed its God, even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly uh, desolate, declares, declares the Lord. Verse 13, he says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And that's the word of God. Um, the text that I've just read, just to help us get the context, um, is uh, some of the first sermons of our prophet Jeremiah. Um, so, Prophet Jeremiah is called at quite an uh, early age. And the reason for his call is so that he would announce the judgment that was going to come upon the children of Israel. And this is during the reign of Josiah. And so, this, this prophet Jeremiah serves in two reigns, the reign of Josiah and also the reign of his son, Zedekiah. And so God comes upon this nation, and the, 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 the children of Israel have denounced God. They have rejected him. They have been swallowed up by the things of the land where they went to. That's Canaan. Just to help us understand that the gods that were being worshipped in Canaan were sex gods. That is Baal, Asherah and Molech. And these are the gods that are being worshipped. And see, it seemed so appealing to the children of Israel that their gods, the gods of the Canaanites, seemed appealing to the children of Israel. And so they change and shift camp and start worshipping these gods. And so God calls Jeremiah, and the call of Jeremiah is so that Jeremiah would help these people be restored to their first love. When the, um, in, when the chapter just begins, God is actually talking and says, go proclaim this to the children of Israel and ask them. Ask them to remember the days 
The, the, the days when they were so devoted to me, the days when they were passionate about me, the days when they would not leave me, they would follow me, the days when I would provide for them, the days that I had given myself for them, that any nation that touched the children of Israel was a nation that was against God. And when we read the stories of the Old Testament, we understand that it is God fighting against the gods of the other nations and the children of Israel fighting against the people. But every time God has fought with a nation, he fights so that he can exert his supremacy. I give an example. The... The, the, the children of Israel are in Egypt. And God hits Pharaoh with nine, ten plagues. All these plagues are to address a God that was worshipped by the Egyptians. Nile was such a God. Pharaoh himself was such a God. Then the Amalekites and all these nations, as they are fighting, God wants to assert authority that he is above every other God. But then when we get to the text that we've just read, the children of Israel have been caught up in the things of the land that they had gone to. And the worship of Baal seems appealing and the worship of Asherah seems appealing. And the children of God are lost in it. And God is trying to remind them and ask them, have you ever seen a nation leave its gods to worship anything else? He actually calls them and says, go, go check out. Go to the neighboring countries and see whether this ever happened anything like that. And beloved, this, this has never happened anything like that. This was the first. God actually reminds them and tells them it is like a bride. How a bride can forget the attires of our wedding. This is what this text implies. If a bride can forget the attires of wedding, it means she has for forgotten the date of the wedding. If she can forget the date of the wedding, is she, this implies that she has either, she's questioning the one she's to be married to. That her allegiance to the groom is at question. And God likens these people and tells them that you have prostituted yourself. And this is true. I mean, the children of Israel had left their allegiance from God and they were signing treaties with other countries, with Assyrians and the Egyptians because they knew that these were strong armies. And so they wanted to be in a good relationship with them so that when never it would happen that they would need to attack people, they wouldn't be part of the people that were going to be attacked. I'm just painting a picture here. The situation is so bad that the priests, them who were custodians of truth, do not know God. The situation is, is bad that the priest does not even know God. Their shepherds, their rulers had transgressed against God. That's, in, that's found in verse 8. And the prophets were prophesying by Baal. Believer, this is to tell us that it was so bad. See, this story is not a new story. In the book of Judges, the Bible records and says that when the generation of Joshua died, there came up a generation that did not know God. And this is the generation that Jeremiah is talking to. It had no idea of God. Did, did God move? Did God change camp? Is God at, 
at, at fault here? Is he to be questioned for not asserting his power over his people? Is God at question? Jeremiah continues and says, and this is God really talking to Jeremiah, says that my people have committed two sins. Sin number one, they have forsaken me. And if that is not enough, they have found out another way for God. They have sorted the situation with something else. It says they hewed out cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. See, for us to get a better understanding why Jeremiah is using cisterns, this is the reason. Israel is a desert. But then there were springs that would bubble out cool, fresh water. So Jeremiah likens what they have done, the children of Israel have done, that they have left the cool, the fresh water, the Spring that never dries out. And they have dug cisterns. This is, what, this is what cisterns were. So they would dig, carve rocks. And these rocks would, have, uh, would create something like a reservoir where rainy, rainy water would be collected. And if this water stayed for some while, it would be stale. And it wouldn't be as enjoyable. We can't compare that water with the springs of living water. But then, to their folly, the cisterns are broken. So if they are broken, they can't hold water for such a long time. How does this text then apply to us in Kenya right now? Believer, this is what has happened. We have forsaken our God, and we've hewed cisterns for ourselves. And you may be here and wondering, but how? We are in church. How have we forsaken God? We forsake the Lord every time we run away from him and come up with our own means. See, what the children of, uh, what the, 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 the people of Babel did, they built a tower, and the intention of building the tower was to make a name for themselves and to reach to God. And this is what we do. We want to get to, to God in our own craftiness. We've realized that this God of the Bible is, is, has so many rules so that we have a God. We have a God for our own selves. Oh, Christian, let me reveal to us that every moment when we pray, it reveals, it reveals, it reveals to us who's God. If all your prayers if all your prayers are that the Lord would do something for you and they have nothing to do with his will and his glory, it reveals that then you have a God that would satisfy you better if you got other than him who's Yahweh and Jehovah. Believer, the Christian has moved away from God and dug for themselves cisterns that won't hold water. That is why we are struggling with sin. Sin is a bottomless pit that is never satisfied. It promises the world but only delivers so little. It promises the world and gives so little. Immediate gratification that does not sort the heart the thirst of a man. 
See, what this text is revealing to us is that we are all created to worship. We either worship God or worship something else. See, what this text is revealing to us, believer, is that we are created for worship. And if our worship is not in God, it is in something else. And the church, the 21st church, has built gods for themselves. Believer, the church has so been diluted that if it was poison, it would kill no one. And if it was cure, it would cure no one. Why? Because we have polluted. We have left the springs of living waters and hewed for ourselves cisterns that cannot hold water. And the reason why, it is this. Our priests, our priests do not know God. They don't know God. They do not know God. We have moved so far, so far from the Lord that only power encounters insinuate that God is here. People are looking for power. People are looking for revival. But believe a revival starts in prayer. Revival starts in repentance. The only way the Lord is going to restore us is if we go back to the first love. The children of Israel are called and told, what did I ever do to you? What did your father see that they left me? They left me and went after worthless things. And in their search for worthless things, they became worthless. Believer, the church has lost the power. It has lost the power to cause revival in a nation because we have run for worthless things and in its pursuit we've become worthless. Believer, the church has diluted the content, the content of the gospel. We have presented a half-baked gospel that is not true. Our priests do not know the Lord. We have contaminated the altar, allowing politicians and people to come and deceive in our pulpits. This is, this, is, this, is, this is the same thing that is happening in the children of Israel. He says, then their leaders have transgressed. Oh, our leaders have transgressed. Oh, our leaders are corrupt. We have left the springs of living water only to dig cisterns of our own. Believer, let me tell you something. The cisterns that we, we dig will only sort us for a short while. They will quench our thirst today, but they won't tomorrow. Praise the Lord. They will satisfy us today. They will make us look good today. But they won't do that tomorrow. They won't. And the lie, the lie is this. The lie. For anyone who moves from the springs of living water to these cisterns that are man-made, this is the lie. That there's a better place to be at than at the center of God's will. I think there's a guy who says that at the heart of every prodigal son is the lie that there is a better place to be at than in the father's house. Oh, church, let me tell us that any time we have wronged him, we do not need to run away from him. We need to run to him. For he, he is our assurance. He is our peace. He is our restoration. Oh, believer, let me, let me tell it to you again. Jesus Christ is our restoration. He hung on that cross so that we may be reconciled to the Father. He hung on that cross so that we who were sinners, we who had rebelled against the Master, would be accepted back.
we have forsaken him. Our priests have forsaken him. Our leaders have forsaken him. Our prophets, they have prophesied by Baal. Believers have been led astray. The church in Kenya has been led astray by false prophets. False teachers. Men who stand before people and deceive with confidence. And declare things that are not true. The Bible explains it clearly and says that these men prophesy by Baal. Because God is not a God that contradicts himself. God will only say one thing and he will establish it. It is tiring. It is heartbreaking to see the kind of lies that are in our church. The same thing was happening with the children of Israel, beloved, my, my, my friends. The same thing. The same thing was happening. Men would stand up and say something that is not of God. And they would move masses. Because you see, what we want to hear is what our eating ears are, are receptive to. There is that which we want to hear. But we do not want to hear that God will allow us to go through this moment of exile for his glory. Every time I have listened to truth, truth has broken me. Because truth is offensive. And these guys were hating on Jeremiah because of the truths that he was speaking. Friends, their priest had prophesied by Baal. And I, I lack words to explain how bad the prosperity gospel has marred the gospel of Jesus Christ. Where men are in it for the profit. Oh, the reason why we followed Jesus is because he comes with bread. You remember this parable, Jesus is, Jesus is actually it's not a parable, Jesus is preaching. And before that he had fed 5,000 men and men are following him. They've actually started to shout and they want to make him the king. And he preaches to them such a solely difficult gospel that they leave. And he tells them, I know you guys are not following me because I am, you've known that I am the Messiah. You're following me so that you may be full, that I may feed you again. Believer, that's not the reason why he came. Jesus did not have to come so that you would be rich. He did not have to die so that you would be a billionaire. It's a good thing for millionaires in the kingdom, but that wouldn't cause Jesus to die. Such a too small a thing. Too small a thing for my Savior to be hanging on the cross so that I can drive a car. Too small a thing. And then miss out on heaven? Miss out on heaven? He says, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Believer, we have left there's so much spit on Jesus' face. Why? Because the things we are saying, the things we profess to believe, aren't true. That's not the Bible. Why is it that being a Christian in Kenya is cool? And when I become a Christian in Somaliland, I will die. Why is it a good thing? Why is it a cool thing to be a Christian here? But then when we are there, we, our, our lives are at danger. Aren't they professing the same God? Is it not the same Jesus that died on the cross that died for me and also died for them? So it means something. Believer, it means something. That Jesus Christ calls us to live a radical life. A radical life for him, for his glory. The Bible says that he died so that those who live will not live for themselves, but they will live for him who died and rose again. The prophets have transgressed. They are prophesying by Baal. And what about the people? 
The people have prostituted themselves. They are now worshipping Baal. Oh, they are now fascinated by the things Baal can give. They are wondering, wow, the, the land is fertile. Now they are at peace and they are prostituting themselves. Men that have no accountability, men that are living reckless lives, men that do not want to disciple and parent their children, men that have decided to leave their families, leave their wives, and do whatever they want to do. Remember that when these guys are leaving the, uh, the, the land of Egypt, they have been told, they have been told, please, when the houses are so built, when you have kettles upon kettles, when you have gold and silver, please do not leave your God. Do not leave your God. Why? Because prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave this God I love. Oh, believer, it is so easy to leave this God we love. It is so easy to leave him and follow Baal and follow the things of this world. So easy. Church, it is easy to leave all these things, to, to leave the faith we profess so dearly and follow the things of this world. Why? Because the things of this world have an immediate satisfaction that we are all looking for. It gives us an immediate peace. But oh, how fleeting it is. The writer of Ecclesiastes says it is a chasing after the wind. It is vanities of vanities. Believer, it is vanities of vanities. Why would I gain everything in this world and lose my soul? Why would the church be running for all the things in this world and lose its soul, lose its purpose? Believer, God says that we are, Jesus calls us his bride. How sad it is when the bride forgets his, her attire. How sad it is when the bride forgets the wedding day. How sad it is when the bride changes allegiance and all of a sudden starts following other people. This is what we've done. And so what is this living water then? Jesus actually explains what the living water in, in John chapter 4 when he's talking to the Samaritan woman. This is what he says. He says from verse 10, if you knew the gift of, of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me water, you would have asked him and he would have given you the living water. Believer, we have the living water in Jesus Christ. Water that satisfies. Oh, is Jesus your greatest reward? Is he your greatest reward? Is he all that you live and cling on? Or do you have Jesus plus other things? I love what Pastor Mwash says, that Jesus did not come to improve us. He didn't. He's the living water. Oh, he bubbles out life every moment. That even in my times of despair, in moments of crisis like this one, Jesus gives me peace every moment. Not because things are okay, not th because things will be okay, but because Jesus is on the throne. Believer, our confidence comes when we know that Jesus is on the throne, that he ordains things, allows things, and ends things. That I might be in a season of my life, difficult moment of my life, but I know he gives hope. He gives hope. I remember growing up, my parents are retrenched. All of them, we were in school, and we had no hope. I remember that morning, my mom and dad sit us down and they tell us, guys, we can't even continue paying for your school fees. Just a week after that, my grandmother from my dad's side passes on. 
a week after we've buried my grandmother, my, grand, uh, my grandfather from my mom's side passes on. A week after that, my uncle passes on. A week after that, our last born brother, Caleb, is born. And it is such a hard moment in our life. And I remember my mom during morning uh, devotions in the morning, she would wake us up and tell us, you know what? All these things may be tough, but Jesus is on the throne. And I would look for Jesus and not see him. Are there moments in your life where you've looked for Jesus and you can't see him? But let me tell you something. Even when you cannot see him, trust his attributes. He's a righteous God. He's a caring God. He is a God who's concerned. Let me tell you something. Even in even the children of Israel, in their deepest despair, God calls them and tells them, repent. And when you repent, I am a God who's slow to anger and abiding in love. Oh, I love asking this question and I will ask it to us today. What happens when your God dies? What happens when that thing that you've built your life around crumbles and falls down? The answer is simple. You will crumble and die with it. But what happens if your God cannot die? If they tried to kill him and he did not die? Oh, he lives and sits at the right hand of God, interceding for me. What happened if that is your God? You have a firm foundation. Or you, your faith is anchored on him. On him who is the spring of living water. Oh, believer, how, how, how much I wish you knew. How much I wish you knew the thing that we so easily throw away. Oh, much I wish we knew the blood that we have been saved with. The Bible says it is not corruptible like gold or silver. Ah, I don't know whether you get me. It says that it is not corruptible. It is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That blood secures my eternity. Oh, believer, I may struggle in this world. I may die a poor man. But I want to live to glorify my Lord and Savior. I may not get all these blessings that people are talking about. That's cool. That's cool. Jesus is my reward. He says, he's my portion in the land of the living. See, believer, you will not only enjoy a relationship with God in heaven. No. If that was the case, you would have given your life to Jesus and immediately he would have transferred you to heaven. No, that's not, the, that's not the case. He saves you so that you can enjoy him here. Oh, believer, the safest place to be is at the center of God's will. Even in the midst of COVID-19. Ah, if you are in the will of the Lord, your heart is secure. I remember a time ago in 2017, we were praying for a friend of mine who's going to serve the Lord in Somaliland among the Muslims. And I remember when one of our, of our sisters, as she was praying, she prayed a very, very provoking prayer and, and said, Lord, for, for some of us, we may not understand, but for this brother, this brother who leaves us and goes to reach out to the Muslims, this brother has just laid his life on the table. He may never come back. But Lord, if it is your will, so be it, so that the glory of the Lord will be seen. Believer, we need to live such a radical life. We need to live such a radical life for the Lord because he has paid the price. He's called us to live such a life. Man, he's the living water. How painful it is when we forget the living water and start digging holes and cisterns of our own. Jesus continues telling this woman that everyone who drinks of this water, ha, this, this, these cisterns, they will be thirsty. Man, if you, if you, if you, if your desires are met by the things of this world, or if you want riches, or if you want a beautiful wife for the people who've not married, or if your desire is to have a good family, these things, these things of this world, are, they won't satisfy you for long. They will not. 
And then he continues and says this, but whoever drinks of the water that I give him, he will never be thirsty again. Oh, Lord, give me that water. I want that water that I will not be thirsty again. This is what Jesus is implying, that if we love him, if we go back to him, go back to him, him who's the living, living water, we will not thirst again. That it is true we may go through the life, life and the pains of it. But we will be satisfied. Believer, ask yourself, is Jesus your greatest reward? Is he really your greatest reward? If they came here and told us, all of us, denounce Jesus and leave, how many of us would live for him? Is he your greatest reward? Does Jesus give you the deepest satisfaction? Because if he does not, we have dug cisterns of our own. What happens when your God dies? Oh, when a nation rejects its God. Jesus is the living water. And as I come to a conclusion, then what shall I do in light of these truths? What then should I know? Number one, that repentance precedes restoration. Oh, believer, there is no restoration if we do not repent and go back to him. And repentance is just not saying that, oh, I am a sinner and no. It is saying that, meaning it, and relying on him. It is Jesus who works in us to will and to act according to his good pleasure. Restoration. The only restoration that we should so eagerly seek, await for. Oh, believer, the restoration that I am seeking and eagerly waiting for is found in Jesus. Number two, that Jesus is our restoration. Ah, Jesus is our greatest reward. He's my restoration. He's my peace. Only, only through him will everything be restored to the Father. Or the Bible says in the book of Romans that the creation is groaning for that day. What day? When Jesus will be revealed. When he will, he will come with power and reign and rule. And on that day we will be fully restored to our God and Savior. Ah, when death is going to be utterly destroyed, when sin will be completely defeated. That's our restoration. That's our peace. Oh, believer, how I pray that you will desire a deep, deep fellowship with the Lord, a deep fel fellowship with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I, I tend to believe that most of us here are born again. But the danger with a shallow Christianity is accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior alone. But listen, where there is a Lord, there is a slave. Where there is a master, there is a slave. And if Jesus is your Lord, you are the slave. What it actually means is that I should live my life for him. I should desire to live for him, for his glory, to honor him. A friend of mine once gave me a very amazing analogy of how God owns us twice says God owns us, number one, by creation. He created everyone, and so because of that, he owns you. And then number two, for the believer, he owns, hey, mini mkamba, he, where, nani atansemea ikitu? He owns you, that's the word, he owns you by redemption. That 
He not only owns you because he created you, he owns you because he bought you with the precious blood of his son. And so by redemption, you belong to him. So you are, you are God's property twice. So live like it. Oh, believer, live like it. Because you can't even pay the debts that you owed him. Oh, you couldn't. He says that your goodness, your righteousness are filthy rags. You, you can't. And believer, imagine you offend a God. And then this God that you have offended decided to reconcile himself to you. And so he gives his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you, for the mistakes that you had done, so that he can own you again. A story is given of a boy who built a certain boat and loved to see how that boat was floating on the waters of a stream. But then one day he was caught up with it and the boat disappeared. But then one day when he was in the market, he sees his boat. He goes to the shopkeeper and says, this is my boat, I want it. But then the shopkeeper says, you have to buy it. And so he buys it again. He owned the boat by creation. Now he owns it because he has bought it. Oh, believer, we were bought. We are not our own. Are we together? We are not our own. He says that he died for those who live so that he, he died for the sinners so that them that live will not live for themselves, but they will live for him. Jesus is our restoration. Number three, holiness marks this restoration. Oh, he says he is a holy God. Be drawn, draw nearer to me and I will draw nearer to you. He's holy. He's such a holy God, he can't stand sin. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah 53, it says that it pleased God to see the, the pain and the anguish that he had to go through so that he would be an atonement for our sins because he's a holy God. He's such a holy God that when he created men, Adam and Eve, he gave them a command. Thou shall not eat from the tree that is in the middle. Believer, I believe that that was enough word to help these people live a life that was glorifying to God. If only they would have stuck to it. He's such a holy God. He hates sin. He hates sin so much. But then he's such a loving God that even when we have sinned, he still gives up his son to die for us on the cross so that we may be reconciled back to him. Praise the name of the Lord. And number four, prayer causes restoration. Oh, friends, that if we pray, the Bible says that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and ask for forgiveness, I will hear them and I will heal their land. Remember Jesus teaching his disciples how to pray the book of Matthew chapter 6, it says that, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that when they, they will be heard for their many words, do not be like them. For your father knows what you need even before you ask. And then he says, pray then like this, our father who art in, in heaven, our Lord be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, give us this our daily bread. Friends, when you look at this prayer, it, 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 it is so God-centered 
so god centered and the, i want to challenge us and tell us that god only answers prayers that are god centered prayers that are focused on him it says our father who art in heaven hallowed be your name let your name be set apart let your name be singled out let your kingdom come let your will be done and then says give us this our daily bread and i want to suggest to us that jesus has a an intention why he's telling his disciples to pray for our daily bread believe i want to ask us when is the last time you really believed on god for something when is it when is the last time that you believed god for something you are sure that if it does not come today oh i am coming to him and i want to challenge us in obedience to this text we should present and create opportunities where we will be utterly dependent on god utterly dependent on, on him because god is a perfect father and he's the one who gives good gifts to each and every one of us and as i come to an end i like us to just stand up and for the five minutes or so that are remaining i like each and every one of us to just search their hearts search their hearts ask the holy spirit of god to search you through and through and reveal places in your life where you have left the springs of living water and so much delighted in building things for your own and as we do this i'll ask the praise and worship team to come and help us sing a song just to ask god lord search our hearts search our hearts oh lord and may you reveal that which is true We bless you and we give you a holy name. We adore you, O oh Lord. We give you all the praises and honor. May you search us, search us through and through. And may you test test our hearts and souls and find us to be worthy. Lord, that which does not please you, oh, I pray that you will help me by the grace that you have given me to say no to ungodly things may you help me lead a life that honors and glorifies you i thank you and i bless you jesus christ mm. a home for you you lord let everything i do open up place where you want to be a place where you want to be come and be my heart your home come and be everything come and be everything i ever thought i know search me through and through Touch me through and through till my heart becomes a home for you, a home for you.
Heavenly Father, we thank you and we bless you for the sharing of your word. I want to pray for all of us that are here, Lord, that may you make our hearts long for, may you make our hearts desire you, you who's the living water. We bless you, give you all the glory. We thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your word that comes so that men may be set free. We thank you for your word that is a mirror that reflects what we are. We ask for your forgiveness for places where we have exalted material gain and possession above you, O oh Lord. And ask that, Heavenly Father, you will be, you will be our deepest desire. Bless you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and we believe. Thank you very much. God bless you.